We have an economy and the economy is going. There's a lot of people think it's going up. A lot of people think it's going down. <laughs> There's a lot of people think that they're not sure which direction it's going at all. And CERN Basher is going to try to bring us some recent stats that he's run across with his own variation and version of thinking about them so that we might get wiser about our investment careers such as they are. CERN Basher, thanks for being on again. Hi, Randy. It's great to be back. <laughs> All right. So you've been uh, dancing around the financial universe, and these are things that just particularly jumped out at you. Yeah, it might come as a surprise to you, but these charts that I'm going to share with you today are not mine. <laughs> They're all from somebody else. Or some okay, other people. all right. <laughs> I've, I've taken a break from, from uh, making my own charts uh, for this show. Okay, well, let's so see. Let's, let's, let's start here with an interesting one. This is one that caught my eye. This is the interest payments by US households. And the interesting thing about this chart is that the interest payments on non-mortgage debt, credit cards, student loans, are now higher than the interest payments on mortgage debt. Wow. It's kind of an interesting milestone. It is. Now there could be, I can think of a couple of three things that would be impacting that. One is a lot of folks have their homes paid off now. Yes, and a lot of folks have uh, interest rates locked in, right? At so three percent, mortgage and a half. rates have gone up. Right, they're still paying the same old three, four percent rate. Right. Okay, and so that would be a couple of things that would, and the fact that the mortgage is still increasing, would be partially due to the fact that everything that's been sold for the last year and a half has been at six percent, seven percent, even over seven percent. That's right. Okay couple of things going on there. What yeah, you and, and here is, um, oops, there we go. Uh, one of the culprits here is the interest rates on credit cards have gone up a lot. Yeah. Right. So let's say from, you know, 10 to 20% in the space of a couple oh, of years. Holy mackerel. Roughly. And you can see the mortgage rate effectively is still quite low because yeah. the majority of people have not moved, even though rates have gone up. Right, right, right. So you're saying overall for everybody that has a mortgage, this is what the average person is is paying. Okay. That's right. So that I thought was interesting. Yeah, very interesting. And then here it is, uh, the household debt burden. So even though those numbers have reached you know record levels, the household debt burden, so interest payments as a percentage of U.S. household income, is still not too crazy. Yeah. Which is yeah. interesting and a little bit surprising. Well, it's back to, it looks like it's just slightly above pre-pandemic levels. Um, so again, that would probably be reflecting the fact that some folks are paying these much higher numbers now in the last two years. Yeah. And I'm sorry if I have an interruption here. My son is telling me that there's mail for me. So oh, okay. I get a mail delivery here. Um, <laughs> The next chart I thought that was interesting is um, is how far people live away from their place of work. And folks that were hired since the pandemic, the trend for them has been to live further and further away from the office. Interesting. Right. So I guess this is maybe with the work from home trend still playing itself out. Oh, living further and further away. So this is not. Yes. Actually, their drive, they're not they're not saying that the drive is this far. This right. is the overall distance that the they distance are living from. further away from their place of work, even though I they see. may not go there that often. They may they may be going there more now than they were a year or two ago. But a lot of people have chosen to live further away from their place of work. Right. This also might be re reflecting a, a little bit of a move out of the cities uh situation as well people moving from this there was a very big uh concentration of uh, millennials that had decided they loved the city they were going to live downtown commute uh, by bus or by train or uh subway whatever um and that has now reversed 
And now there's folks moving out to the burbs, partially, as you point out, because they they can still work for that same company, not necessarily go in every single day. That's right. So a bit of quality of life situation playing itself out here, perhaps. But I thought this was just an interesting chart. Sure, sure. Yep. Another one that's maybe not so much fun, but for investors in EVs, maybe a, a welcome sight. Uh, price of gasoline is heading back up again. And has been for some time since really the beginning of the year. Um, and this may help in terms, of in terms of driving more people to purchasing an EV at some point during 2024. On we'll the other side of the coin, that. yeah, on the other side of the coin, it's a major impactor on inflation and ultimately could impact uh, whether or not the Fed lowers rates or not. So we've got both uh, Texas Intermediate and Brent um, now having moved from the low 70s to the high 70s and early and low 80s. And we've got, as of to yesterday, both gasoline and oil su supplies in the United States are a little off, a little less inventory right now. Um, so that's been impacting uh, impacting uh, the numbers. Yeah, and just on the point of inflation, while this does you know boost inflation numbers, it is also a drag on the economy. Right. So it's one of those things where inflation goes higher, but it hurts economic growth. And so if you're the Fed, you probably look at it and say, you know what, do we hold off cutting rates because of this? Probably not. Okay. Okay. Um, another interesting stat, auto insurance rates are moving up rapidly. And everybody knows this when they get their auto insurance bill, but year over year now in January, a 21% year over year increase in auto insurance costs. Um, I hear a lot of people complaining about this. Yeah. So there's a whole bunch of reasons for this. And some of them are transitory. I know mm -hmm. that's a, a bad word to use. <laughs> <laughs> but some of them are transitory and some of them should only start to flatline. So the main thing that's transitory is that both the automobiles themselves were very expensive last year. If you were replacing an automobile used or new, plus parts were in, sh in, uh, sh in shortages. So getting the parts was also expensive. Mm -hmm. You also had labor shortage. So labor was popping up. So in every way, shape, and form, auto insurance needed to go up. Uh, what, most people may or may not realize that the auto insurance companies once a year go to the state that they're in, and they have to make a proposal in terms of what they're going to do in terms of their rates based on their profits at any given time. Last year, when all of these insurance companies went to the states, they said, look, we have to have a big increase. We're losing money hand over fist. But- you're the, since this time, the cost of automobiles, new automobiles and used automobiles has come down. The cost of the actual parts has come back down to normal. And so, and labor, of course, is flatlining. Then there's another factor that's, that's going into this is that the more sophisticated cars are costing more to repair. So I had uh, on our Model Y, we had a minor fender bender. We're talking about park, I mean, not even fender. Well, I guess it was a fender. Just above our back wheel, a uh, somebody hit us in a parking lot going about three miles an hour. The dent was barely noticeable. My wife has had to point it out to friends to say, well, there it is right there. There's the dent. $7,000 because of the electronics that are wow. right behind where that uh, where that that part are. So you have to replace the entire part, even though it's a minor dent. So these are that's going to be a flatlining. So that's not going to continue to go up. That's going to that's going to be something that will flatline, and the other items should be coming down. So we could look at at least next year we might not be seeing these kind of increases anymore. Back down to where the increase might be one or two or three percent. That would be my guess. Well, that would be welcome. The thing that I think about when I see this, I think about in a world of autonomy. Not yeah. only do you save money from not having to buy an operated vehicle but you don't need to buy insurance anymore. Right. Right. Another factor that's not an inconsiderable amount of money for people. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So on the topic of the Fed cutting rates, when, when are they going to do this, Randy? Do you think <laughs> it's going to be in March, April, May, or June? Or July? So I guess not April. I guess they're taking April off. We have a March meeting, a May meeting, a June meeting, and a July meeting. 
Right. Yeah. So, you know, sooner the sooner the better. But at this point, it I think everybody would be shocked if it was before June. The market is telling us that there's a 4% chance they cut rates in March, that there's a 26% chance they cut rates in May, that there's a 74% chance in June and a 92% chance in July. Okay. <laughs> So it seems like June or July is uh, where the heavy betting has been placed. Right. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, of course, as we know, things can change. Sure. Um, there was a 90% chance that they were going, going to cut rates in March. Right. Yes. In December. <laughs> so that's only three months ago. So, yes, things change rapidly in the, in the betting markets of when the Fed will cut rates. Exactly. Yep. Um. This is one as a financial advisor that causes me great pains because, you know, diversification is a good idea, right? Yes. But yet it hasn't paid off for a long, 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 long time when it comes to international investing. Right. And so this is over the last 16 years, the S&P is up 427%. The international stock market, developed market, excluding the United States, MSCI world is up only 85% and the emerging markets up 36%. Wow. So this is a solid case here as to why diversification is a terrible idea. <laughs> at, least into international, at least into international stocks. Yeah. <laughs> at least looking at historical data. Now, there are other periods in history when this has also occurred. And it wasn't to the U.S.'s favor. There were periods in history when it were in emerging markets and international stocks massively outperformed the United States. So that is also possible at some point in the future as well. So there's a there's a theory bouncing around right now. That, and it's not, I mean, it's. I think that there may be peer-reviewed papers on it that you can do a fairly good estimating job on the performance of a country, their, their economy, based on their population increasing. So if you have population increase, then you're gonna have more people obviously to work, more people to produce, more people to buy, et cetera, et cetera. If you have fewer individuals, then all of the above go in the opposite direction. Well, all of the Western nations are now dropping population. Mm -hmm. Japan has dropped a huge amount of population, dropping, I think almost a million last year alone. Um, and they're in, they're actually importing labor for the first time ever. Um, they're, I think, uh, maybe up to 2% of their population is not Japanese now. <laughs> so that's huge for them. Uh, South Korea is dropping in population. China is dropping in population. Um, so pretty much all of the places that have important stock markets are dropping in population. The United States continues to increase, but only because of immigration. Well, that's a good theory. And it may be correct. I think there's some other factors at play as well. We'll get to that in just a second. Okay. I would also say for the people that are doing that study, I hope that they're keeping their eye on the population of humanoid robots. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> because they may wonder, why is this market doing so well if they're not counting the humanoids? That's right. That a flaw in their study. That could be. <laughs> okay. So back to... Uh, you know, workers and, and so on. This is an interesting stat they keep track of the percent of percent of US workers quitting their jobs. Yes. So usually when workers quit, it's a sign of you know strength in the labor market. People are feeling emboldened. Uh also maybe an inflationary sign as well. People feel like they are empowered to ask for more pay, uh, quitting their job to go work at a job that pays more. So the quit rate is the lowest since August of 2020. Mm -hmm. So this is seen as progress on the sort of fight against inflation. Right. Yes, so. I would agree. I think there's also at least a possibility that this is partially due to people settling in. They've changed jobs a couple of times during the pandemic. They've mm -hmm. gotten their salary that they were really looking for, or they found a position that they really like. Um, and so I think there would be, again, one of these kind of boom bust situations where there would be a settling down of this stat. Yeah. And like all things in economics, everything that's bad is good. 
and everything that's good is bad. So right. the lower the quit rate, yes, the less mobile the workforce, the better it is in the economic viewpoint. Yes. And speaking of that, tomorrow is an interesting day. Do you know what's happening tomorrow? Oh, yes. <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> it's one of the big days each month, at least it's certainly in this market. It's payroll. It's a, yeah. Bureau of Labor Statistics gives us their numbers. It's Employment Friday, and we're supposed to be very focused on this and very interested in this in this number. However, I would just like to point out, uh, courtesy of Jim Bianco here, who has this nice chart that tracks the, uh, in this case, this is the, the response rate to the survey. And the response rates are basically around 50% or less. They've been trending down. Wow. And so to, to, for the for the initial first release, the response rate is much higher for the second and third and third, third and final release. I see. So the lesson here is to be careful that the revisions on the employment numbers uh, recently have been quite large. Yes, they have. So don't take the first release at face value. It may it may be changing quite significantly for the second and third release. That is the most interesting chart you've shown me so far because everybody's wondering why in the heck are these things so far off? And at least partially what you're saying is it's due to the fact that they're just not getting many people to pick up the phone the uh, first time around and it takes another couple of calls uh, to get the response. Wow, interesting. Yeah, and these are these are surveys. So yeah, the, the methodology and the methodology could be flawed or, or whatever. But you can see last December, there was 117,000 oh, yeah. person revision in the number. Yeah. So if you were making investment decisions based on, you know, the December number, well, it turns out that that was incorrect. Yeah. So Every as interesting as Employment Friday is, I just caution you to be a little, little bit careful with this. Well, I, and I think a lot of people, the people that are really paying attention have started to be paying attention to this number. And that's what I'm most interested in tomorrow is the revision, because last yeah. month was such an outlier in terms right. of the 335,000 added or something on that order, um, which was not expected, which was way more than most than any month in a very long time. So very interesting to see the revision tomorrow. And you can see the, the band over time in that top chart, the green and the red, that this expanded over time. Yeah. The absolute revision amount is has increased. So yes, it's a sign of you know, the challenge in terms of getting the the correct survey data, you know, getting it right the first time. Yeah. Okay. So, speaking of Japan, I feel like we're bouncing around a lot, but it's all kind of making sense. Yeah. Um, speaking of Japan, their stock market reached an all time high, and the last time this happened was a long time ago. Long like time ago. Eighty nine. Yeah. So if you were a buy and hold investor, if you bought the Japanese stock market at the peak and said, you know, I'm holding this, right? you're back to break even now. Wow. If you would have purchased in over time, you would have made money. Dollar mm -hmm. cost averaging would have, would have worked nicely in this case. Yeah, yeah. But man, what a long, tough journey this has been. Indeed. And again, a lot of people, well, there's a, a number of of elements that people have suggested about this. One of those is the population bust. I mean, they literally have ghost cities in Japan and have for many, many years where everybody's moved out. There's nobody left. Um, you also had a law of large numbers problem where the Japanese were investing their money that they were made. They were making money hand over fist mm -hmm. and they were investing it all over the world, buying out all the golf courses, buying out most of Oahu, um, some of the other beach towns were heavily invested with Japanese. Basically, they just ran out of things to invest in that they understood um, is, is one of the theories. Um, and uh, the prices of the things that they did understand got crazy. Uh, yeah. beach, beachfront property in Oahu went absolutely you know, nuts. So there's a whole bunch of theories about what's going on here. But uh, uh, interesting to see they're at least back to where they were. Yeah, and also, you know, if you would have invested in Japan in the 1970s oh, yeah. and forgotten about it and never checked the newspapers or the stock pages or your account statements until 
last week or this week, right? You might have been pleasantly surprised with how you did. It actually, it, you know, if you did a if you drew a straight line from the bottom left up to the top right, the Japanese stock market actually has done pretty well. It looks like about a twenty five times. Yeah. So, you about know, twenty times. Twenty it's, times. 20 times. It, it's all about cool. your perspective. Yeah. 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 Um, right. And this is another reason not to look at your portfolio on a on a decade basis. You should check it only every three decades. <laughs> okay, so coming back to the United States, we have an interesting situation going on right now, and it's been happening for a while. The Magnificent Seven, these companies have been anointed a special name. Um that comprises of Apple, Microsoft, NVIDIA, Google, Amazon, Meta, and Tesla makes the list. In the last year, from, fe from January 2023 through February 2024, they're up 92%. If you look at the S&P, it's up 32. But if you take the S&P and take the Meg 7 out, the S&P is up 17%. Yeah. So it greatly reduces the return on the S&P. But a 17% increase is not a bad thing. That's an okay increase. Not a bad thing, although I wish this chart maybe would have shown the last two years because 2022 wasn't so kind, <laughs> the stock market. But yeah. So there's just been a few big companies uh, bringing up the average right. uh, of the S&P 500. So much for 500 companies. Apparently only seven of them. Yeah, seven there. that matter. <laughs> and here they are this year. Um, again, continuing to bring up the average. Uh, NVIDIA, uh, as of a couple of days ago, is up 74% year to date. Meta is doing pretty well, up 39. Netflix, Amazon, Microsoft. Uh, the S&P is up seven. The equal weighted S&P, so if you just take all 500 companies right. and weight them equally, one 500th, that's up 4%. And then we've got a few uh, companies bringing down the average um, and Tesla there on, on the far right, down 27%. Right. right. So that's always an interesting thing to keep an eye on. Um, one of the concerns is that these Mag7 companies, Magnificent 7 companies, account for too big of a portion of the U.S. stock market. Yeah. And somehow that could be a problem. Well, it may be, but other countries in the world have even greater concentration than we do. Right. So the top 10 holdings, for example, in Ireland account for 80% 80, 80 of the Irish index. Huh. Switzerland, you know, Nestle and some other companies, two thirds of the index and wow. so on the line. Wow. Now, these some of these markets are pretty small, granted, you know, right. the Irish stock market. I, I don't know that anybody could name a company on the Irish stock market. Maybe Guinness. I don't know. <laughs> um, but beyond that, I'm not sure I could name an Irish company. Right. Um, you know, the United States market is massive. So, yes, to have a third of our stock market be comprised of just 10 companies, mm -hmm. you know, it's it does feel a little bit extreme. But that said, if the companies are not too highly valued, then that's OK if their earnings support that the size, mm -hmm. size of the companies. Right. So anyway, that was just it was yeah. just interesting. Yeah, I think. very interesting. Yes. In one of our recent videos, we talked about NVIDIA and we discussed how rapid their stock price and earnings expectations have been, as well as their free cash flow growth. Mm -hmm. This was an interesting comparison of NVIDIA versus Cisco. And I think we mentioned Cisco in our, in our video. And this is overlaying the two. So this is Cisco from 1992 through 1998, the up and the down of Cisco. Mm -hmm. It was up at one point, you know, almost 2,000% and then made almost a round trip back down. And if you overlay NVIDIA from year 2000 to the present, um, it's tracing that uh, arc of Cisco quite nicely. So if you just present this chart by itself, it's like, oh my gosh, here we go again. And... I, I I got this chart from AJ, and I believe he said that the guys on the All In podcast shared this or ah. discussed this. Um, I haven't independently verified that. Right. 
But AJ's point was the following, that if you just share this chart, you're missing out a key part of the story. <laughs> and the second part of the story is this, that the valuation of NVIDIA versus the valuation of Cisco is very different. Cisco went up on the hope and the dreams of future earnings. So its PE went up to 400, 500 times. NVIDIA, on the other hand, its stock price has actually had a hard time keeping up to the earnings. Mm -hmm. They have actually been producing earnings and the PE is still relatively low. Right. Right. This is the chart that AJ shared. Um, I think the numbers that we looked at in NVIDIA were a little bit different than this, but, but still, I think it's still instructive. Right, right, right. So it's great to make comparisons just looking at stock prices, but like a lot of things, there's another side of the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I'm not suggesting that NVIDIA is cheap necessarily, but just a different perspective on just looking at the stock price movement. Sure. Okay. And then last but not least, um, I also mentioned this chart on one of our recent videos. And this is again by, by AJ on X. And it shows the free cash flow, cumulative free cash flow for various EV makers. And if you recall on that show, we looked at Tesla, how they lost about $10 billion mm -hmm. and then made a cumulative $10 billion in a fairly short amount of time. So they, they earned 20 billion of free cash flow to get to a positive 10 billion. Right. You can see Tesla now on this chart is sitting at about 12 billion of free cash flow growth. And he's overlaid the other various other EV makers and their trajectories over time. Mm -hmm. And so far, you know, Neo, I guess, is close to that inflection point that Tesla had, and it remains to be seen whether Neo can make that turn that Tesla did. Neo has lost 8.6 billion in cumulative free cash flow. Mm. Okay. Polestar is down about 5 billion. Vinfast is down about 6 billion. Lucid is down about 9 billion. And they lost the 9 billion faster than Tesla did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Rivian takes first prize yeah. for losing it the fastest and the most. Now, Rivian's just come out today with their new vehicle. And it looks great. The challenge is, is that the solution to this problem? Mm -hmm. AJ points out that that Rivian, you know, they sell their vehicle, the, the uh, R1T, R1S, ninety-four thousand dollars, but it cost them one hundred and thirty-seven thousand to make it. <laughs> right. So, is that a good business model? The challenge with all these EV companies is they need to get to a certain scale, hmm. right? To to take the heavy fixed costs of building these factories, and spread it out over enough vehicles where it, it makes sense and they can make money. I hope that Rivian and other EV makers can do that. I'm really rooting for them, but it's not looking good right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And maybe really? judging it against Tesla is an unfair judgment, but yet that's the data point that we have. And Tesla did it when, you know, there was no EV industry. They they built this thing from scratch. Yeah, there's a, 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 a uh, another theory, an economic theory that says that if you're short of cash, you will you will have a better chance of success, mm -hmm. and and turn your cash flow sooner. And Lucid and Rivian and others have had been a wash in cash, and have spent it like they thought there was no tomorrow. And uh, Tesla, on the other hand, not only were they not a wash in cash, but the cash they had was the owner's cash, <laughs> yeah. and so he was pretty. Uh, pretty much watching the, the bottom line the whole time that they were ramping. And that makes, it makes a difference. It really does. And I thought this was a beautiful presentation of the EV industry in general and where they are with free cash flow. And we talked about the importance of free cash flow. Right. Right. Now, we also said, though, that free cash flow isn't necessarily the end all be all for a company that's building and developing and trying to get to a point in the future. But still, it's an important metric to take a look at, even for companies in this in these early stages. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's the extent of my random wonderful charts for the week. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. I love charts. I love uh, looking at all that stuff. Do it every single day. Some of those I'd never seen before, and they were very instructive. So um, overall, uh, CERN, you do this for a living. You know, you're a stock. An you're an analyst. 
You are looking at uh, helping people to make decisions on stocks. Have you come to a personal conclusion about how the economy is going to end up uh, in the next quarter, two or three? You know, I really try to stay away from making any projections about the economy. And I also Red find are, that it's... Are out loud. <laughs> well, either one. Um, I really find that it's not that helpful to most individuals in their own personal financial journey. It's a great sideshow for Wall Street. It's great for CNBC because they can talk about these things as, you know, on a regular cadence as all this new data. I just find that it's really not that helpful for most individuals. Now, it's important for me as an advisor to be aware and have an understanding of all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But frankly, I don't really use, like the, the number that's reported tomorrow. The payroll number is unimportant to me in terms of how I invest our clients' funds. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Interesting. Interesting to know that. Okay. And um, and so so that would be uh, across the board. You're not like trying to figure out when the Fed is going to make their move or or uh, any of that stuff. So you're you're mostly then long term. You're looking at fundamentals of the companies as opposed to uh, how any economic situation might impact things for a minute. Yeah, I mean, certainly having an understanding of the economic situation is important. Certainly, if the Fed is raising rates versus cutting rates, that leads to very different environments in the stock market. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's important to be aware of that. And certainly, you know, growth oriented companies are going to benefit greatly when the Fed finally does begin cutting interest rates, mm -hmm. right? That that seems clear. It allows for potentially, you know, sort of multiple expansion and all that, um, you know, and we just finished talking about in a previous show about how PE multiples are virtually useless for looking at the valuation of high growth companies. Right. Right. But yet every company does have a multiple. So yes. those multiples will, will go up. Yes. Right? Um, so yeah, it's more looking at the the situation, the outlook for a particular company mm -hmm. and its industry over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what we're more focused on. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, super, super. All right, CERN, thank you as always for bringing your charts and your graphs, even though these didn't happen to be anything you designed, but they were things that you saw and thought were important and, and uh, useful. And I agree with you, I think they're very useful. So. Um, until we see you again, thanks again. And to all of you out there, it has been great talking to you. Thanks, Randy.